And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, creator of the Spellburn TTRPG, and a, and, a, and, a, and a man of questionable sports taste coming to a, coming to us straight from the from the fires of Mount Doom the a man some known as Bernie but we know as Matthew how you doing today man I'm good how are you I'm good I'm good um most of the tree de most of the tree damage from last week has bet has gotten cleared out because well, you pr you probably saw that image that I po that I posted of the tree in my backyard and the invincible table. I I'm sorry, I actually must have missed that one. <laughs> there was a there was, was it, a storm was about a week. Ball? There was a storm about a week ago that knocked down some big trees and completely cut off my, me from my backyard. So I took oh, a geez. photo of it and I said, "Anybody got a chainsaw?" <laughs> And people were less interested in the chainsaw and more interested in the fact that that somehow all the trees missed this glass table in the backyard. Oh wow, lucky table! Mm -mm. And the way that it was shot, it looked it looked like it, it looked like the tree hit the table and the tree lost. <laughs> but I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So for me, um, the first introduction that I had was actually Final Fantasy I. Um, I was obsessed with that game as a kid, and um, I went over to a friend's house, and their older brother had an AD&D book. Mm -hmm. um, I think I was about, I don't know, 10 at the time. Um, and I looked through the AD&D book, and to be honest with you, I could not make heads or tails of, like, half the rules. Um, and I think I was just a little too young to understand it without some help. Um, so I went home and promptly made my own first role-playing game based on a combination between what I understood from AD&D and playing Final Fantasy 1. Mm -hmm. And pro and probably probably having a burning hatred of mimics. <laughs> yeah um and uh you know so that was that was my first real for me was designing my own game in the beginning um what got me what hooked me was about uh two years later i was actually introduced to rifts um <laughs> i know right um well and rifts uh, is rifts. my whipping boy <laughs> How so? Um, it's not because of the setting. It's all because of the because of the mechanics and the navigation. Mm -hmm. uh, that and some of the stuff that I've learned over the years regarding Kevin Cian Beta. Oh, uh, he ha he has a bit he has a bit of a reputation and a, a fair few people who don't care for him. Ah, uh, and but more, but moreover, I'm bit I'm big on navigation in my RPG books. Mm -hmm. Not having an in, not having an index or having an incorrect um, table of contents is a very easy way to piss me off. Yeah, <laughs> and Palladium's books are guilty of both at times. Oh yes. So yeah, I uh, the Palladium system. Like the the world is amazing, you know the classes are amazing, but like that was actually one of the first games that I learned to tear apart so that I could figure out like how do I stop my players from cheesing this game? Especially when the game the game seems to want seems to do everything it can to stump to stumble drunkenly into cheese. Mm hmm. It does that to the point where I had to wonder if the if. Any of the cre any of the creators were born in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> for, 
For those of you who don't get it, Germany is the world's largest per capita consumer of cheese. Mm. This is also why it's unsurprising why power metal is so cheesy. Most of it is from Germany. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I see here. Yeah, it was uh, first. It was that, and then later, my probably my next biggest game was uh, was Vampire the Masquerade that I got into. Mm -hmm. Um, I hope to I hope to God you didn't play a Malkavian. I played one one time in a LARP. Um, and was very turned off by uh, that particular clan. Like, Malkavians are a great character concept, but I've always I've always struggled to wrap my head around them being a full on clan because clans because clans imply organization, and a Malkavi a, a Malkavian is the antithesis to anything organized. Mm hmm. But yeah, I good. What do I know? I was I pl I I play Ventru a lot. I play Ventru and Bruja a lot of the time. Yeah, I uh, um my uh, my favorite are, tend to be Ventru um and Torridor were my favorites. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly Ventru because we own the world, so you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, I love playing influence heavy Ventru. It's actually one of my favorite uh, types of characters to play. Mm -hmm. But I'm ge but I'm guessing that over the years you were somebody who jumped who jumped around between between systems instead of being one of those one system lifers. Oh yeah, I'm definitely not a one system lifer. Um, I I like picking up new games. I like exploring uh, the different storylines and different systems. Um, you know a. It, it's kind of a, a thing that my friends have always joked about is that, you know, it's like if you want to know how to break a system, give it to Matt. <laughs> Although, to, I've, I've seen, I've often seen some people turn up their nose at min maxing or, or break, or breaking a system. Mm -hmm. I, I would argue that that or, or optimization is as much of a part of gameplay as, um, sto as story is. Because maybe it's just me, but I do I do think that's I do think when in certain sectors of the RP of the RPG design scene, I think some people have this almost fetishized reverence for the story aspect above everything else. Well, for me, um, like I like to, I basically had this categorization system for people that you know I play with, mm -hmm. you know, like you know, are you an RP or are you a power gamer? Are you a min maxer? You know, what kind of you know these different adjectives that I use? And I'm primarily an RP, -er, but second secondary, I'm a power gamer. Um, and so to me, min maxing, you know. If that's the if that's the direction I decide to go with the character, if it's within the rules, it's within the rules. Um, and funny enough, in Spellburn, I actually tried to account for min maxers mm -hmm. um, and make it so that if you know you want a min max, you're fully within your rights to do so in this game. Yeah, because what for me for <clears throat> now some of some of it I will admit is I will admit is me t is me taking the piss at. Um, certain traditions for their own sake because I, because well I'm a com I'm a comedian and I'm an internet comedian at that which shows how low my standards are but <laughs> I but um part of part of comedy is po is poking fun is poking fun at the norm mm -hmm. oh and to, and to that e to that end. I ha I have po I have poked fun at the idea at the the fa the fact that's the fact that the same people who tell me about how get about how t about how TTRPGs are about are about the story will have will tell stories about will talk up about how how they managed to break the game with their with their hyper optimized character. Mm -hmm. Um. Not say not saying it's hypocritical, but it well it kinda is. Uh. Well 
You know, that, that's the thing is, is, you know, my viewpoint is, is like, I look at it as the story and the, and the, and the, uh, the character creation processes and the s systems, they rely on one another, but they're kind of separate. Mm -hmm. Like, I never break the story. I can break the system, though. Um, but, you know, like, for me, one of the things that I tried to do was write the system before I ever wrote the story in this game. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I wanted to make sure that things went hand in hand, um, and that to be honest, you know, if you if you make a character in Spellburn that's you know min max and super powerful in certain ways, you're going to have deficits in others. Yeah. And to that to that end, when it comes to when it comes when it comes to that system, a lot of system mm -hmm. design has has a very it's, Especially, especially since the ninth, especially since the late nineties, has had mm -hmm. a all roads lead to Rome kind of attitude. Um, in terms, in terms of there being, in terms of there being one single unifying resolution mechanic that everything is going to stem from in some manner. Mm -hmm. Um, whether it be D one hundred in Palladium, mostly, mm -hmm. or the or the d10 dice pools in vampire you have you have that kind of approach um unfortunately i kind of do um what mine's a d12 system yeah that was that was what i was gonna ask what is the role mm -hmm. in your case or um when you say you're doing d12 are you doing it as d are you doing it as d12 plus a single d12 plus modifiers or are you doing it as a um dice pool how how are you handling it so it's dice pool success based. Um, I actually just found out today um, that uh, my system that I thought was unique is actually pretty similar to another game out there called uh, Ghast Bashers. Yep. Um, which and I've and... Co which I've covered here in the temple in the past. Yep. Yeah. Me and the me and the creator of uh, Ghast Bashers were were sitting here talking today about it, and I was like, "Wow, you know, it's similar. It's not on the head, but it's similar." Um. But it's basically um, for mine. It's uh, it's a rollo system like gas like gas bashers. If I can say this correctly, um, and uh, but for me um, on the upper end of the dice, uh, for elevens are always soft failures, twelves are crit failures. Mm -hmm. um, because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to accomplish a balance between what I see as the attributes, as the raw talent, and your skills as being how skilled your character is and the intersections there between being like low talent, low skill or high talent, high skill, you know, and you know, how many failures, you know, or successes you'll be able to produce, but always having a margin of error where there's always a chance, even if you're an expert of failure. Mm -hmm. And the way you described it is, are you, I know you're using D 12s, but are you using it as a, Aim low system. Yes, it's it, it, yeah, it's a roll low system. So is it is it roll is it aim low compared to an compared to a attribute skill combination? So um, attributes are actually how many how many d12s you roll that that forms your dice pool. Mm -hmm. um, your skill uh, whatever you know whatever your skill number is for how skilled you are is what you're aiming to get below. So, you know, if you were an expert in, say, brawl and punching people, you know, you would have a skill of 10. So you're looking for rolls of 10 and below per success. Um, but like 11s will always be failures and 12s will always be crit failures. Mm -hmm. And with the. So if I so if I've got this, if I've got this right, you're going to mm -hmm. be. Your attribute determines how many you roll. Your skill determines what you're trying to shoot under. Correct. Um, in that regard, I'm kind of get I'm kind of getting flashbacks to Tenra, which is one of, which is on that list of games more people should play, especially people who consider themselves weebs. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I have never actually heard of that game. I, I I won't lie. Like in the last like ten years, I haven't gotten as to get around to as many games as I would have liked to. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ten Robancho Zero is a is a game that I covered a long time ago, and it's one that I've dipped into over the years. Um, mm -hmm. It is one of the more interesting forays that I've had that I've had into the Japanese scene of tabletop. 
And the and one of the <laughs> reasons I ended up calling out whoever was running Katakawa's Twitter because they claimed that the Konosuba TTRPG was the first Japanese tabletop RPG to be translated into English. Mm -hmm. That is not the case. There have been there have been quite a few that have been tra that have been translated. Mm -hmm. Um, the first one was made all the way back in two thousand eight. Mm -hmm. So, some, I've heard so, it made. Yeah, so somebody didn't do the research. But yeah. that be that being said, um, given what you mentioned with the top two results, I'm get is if some if somebody's rolling one if somebody's rolling ones, is there any extra effect on that or not the case? Not the case. Um the, we basically we got rid of we got rid of exploding ones on purpose. And if if I'm being if I'm being honest, exploding dice is something that works better in roll highs than roll lows. Mm -hmm. So I can see why you'd get rid of it. We we also got rid of it because we wanted to make sure like um, so the way that we the way that we structured the playable races in the game was that they actually have uh, they have certain uh, caps that they can't have beyond a certain amount of dice mm -hmm. um, unless they're getting bonus dice from some area. Uh, but they actually can't raise attributes above a certain point, and exploding dice kind of is a way to get around that, and we didn't want that. Yeah, I can, I can, cer I can certainly see that. Um, now a lot of games have some manner of an extra effort system. Um, mm -hmm. In Shadowrun, this is Edge. In World mm -hmm. of Darkness and the subsequent games within that line, it's Willpower. Um, D and D fourth edition had action points. Mm -hmm. um, do you ha and um, Legend of the Five Rings had void? Do you mm -hmm. have some sort of some sort of limited res some sort of limited resource that acts as um, extra effort? I do actually. Um, we have something w w what we call the heroic points. Mm -hmm. um, they're broken up into three categories where you've got. Uh, your close call points to help you deal with physical actions and or countering hit point damage. Um, because hit point damage in this game can take can take a while to heal. Um, we have uh, swab points to help you boost your socials and inspiration points to help you boost your mentals. Mm -hmm. um, how you get those back depends on whether or not you're using the base rules or the optional rules. Um, but um, with the base rules, you just basically get a static amount back per game. With the optional rules, there's actually it's sort of like a morality system for role playing, where you can, depending on the role playing you're doing, you can get back points. So these are the things that are supposed to help you set your set yourself apart from, you know, like you know, an average Joe in the game. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings me that brings me to the to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Um and this is where I'm going to slightly slightly veer into into some into some stuff that's setting related but not quite yet. Okay. Um I'd like to talk a bit on character creation. Mm -hmm. Are you doing a full on point point by a point by approach with both character creation and advancement? So with the character creation section, we were doing that, and then it seems that we 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 have found in multiple playtests that people were basically having a lot of difficulty with it, um, which was surprising to me coming from like you know vampire and stuff like that. But a lot of people were having a lot of difficulty with you know like point buys for the skills and stuff like that. Uh, we have point buys for the attribute section. But we found that we actually kind of had to take skills and more get them more hom homogenized mm -hmm. uh, for, for people to get it correct. Which was, like I said, it was for me. It was a little surprising, but you know, I take my data where I get my data. So, um, so it's kind of a bit of a hybrid of both. Because mm -hmm. a, con a a concern I always have whenever somebody announces that they're going for, that they're doing freeform character creation is mm -hmm. the is the issue of choice paralysis mm -hmm. um and that's not that's not to say that i th that i think having having less choices is, is better but more having to having tools to minimize that I that issue while still allowing for freedom 
because mm -hmm. I'd say the biggest offender of choice paralysis is universal games and superhero style games, just because of mm -hmm. the sheer amount of ways you can take it. But um, I've picked on Shadowrun, for instance, for its choice paralysis when it comes to all of the damn skills. <laughs> mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, we, uh, we we've had to fight a lot with choice paralysis in this game because we have like each class is kind of a thin wedge, and we had a lot more skills. And that was one of the things that kept coming up in playtests was that there was a lot of choice paralysis. So we reduced things down to what we considered a more manageable level. But I also went the route of taking things and putting them into categories so that you basically, you know, humans can, can, we can handle a lot of data and we can handle a lot of choices when it's categorized well. Um, because your brain will sit there and think, you know, if you if you have five categories with you know five choices inside of it, your brain doesn't think you've got twenty five choices. Your brain thinks you have five choices within five categories. Mm -hmm. And since you mentioned classes, I'm curious. I'm curious if these are classes in the traditional sense, or would they be more akin to archetypes? Um. Somewhere in the middle, um, each cl each class is it, it's not like a D and D class where it's like, you know, you choose to play, you know, uh, a brawler and that's all you are. In this game, you actually multi class from the get go. Um, each class is a very thin wedge where you know it's basically it's only dealing with its specialty. It doesn't branch into any other areas. Would it be more accurate to say it's akin to a role master class? I've never played role master. Um. My intro my introduction to Rollmaster was through Middle Earth role playing, which is a simplified version of it, and more <laughs> recently with Against the Dark Master, which is um, a spiritual successor to that. <laughs> but <clears throat> classes in Rollmaster and ga and similar games mainly mainly determine the things that you're going to be better at ta at learning rather than what you can do. So I'd say it's kind of similar to that. You know, you you are you are better at learning um, the stuff that is within your class, but the classes themselves give you the possibility for bonuses uh, that you can like. You get a bonus for just having the class, and then there's other bonuses that you can pick and choose as as you you know as you want. Um, so it's kind of a combination of you know you can get better in this particular way, and you can also use the class bonuses to refine your your skills in these areas you know like a good example is the spy class you know spies can be a lot of different things if you think about it you know you can have your 007 spies you can have your assassin spies you know you can have your you know i'm going to break into this you know place and steal the plan spies or you can um, have your nobody nobody can notice if nobody's left alive to notice Yep. Yeah. Nobody. It, yep. Just the the, the kill them all spy. Mm -hmm. um, you know. You, you and that's one of the things about the system is is that you can be a spy and then you can choose to kind of, you know, pick the the bonuses that you get for being a spy and specialize yourself. You know. And in this system, you know, we we don't penalize multiclassing at all. You know, if a person wants their character to go heavy into their first three classes, go for it. If you want to just keep multi-classing and kind of pick up a little bit of everything, go for it. Have fun. Mm -hmm. um, given th given th given that, I'm guessing that there are more that there are more archetypes than in than in some other works because of the fact that it that it doesn't have to be in depth with each individual one. Correct. Yeah. There's there's a uh, the, there used to be fifty, but we cut them in half to twenty five. Um, we're, we're gonna we're gonna save some of those for later books if the first book is successful. Um, but there's twenty five that are divided in, into five categories. What would those five categories be? Uh, let me see if I can remember off the top of my head. Um, you've got uh, combat. You have knowledge. You have magic. You have specialty and the last one social mm. i think it is uh yeah the those would be the five categories um and then there's five classes per category and the, the categorization system is just to help people 
not have as much choice paralysis. You know, it doesn't actually affect your ability to choose classes between things. Yeah, and some of the some of those I can see I can see where they lean into. Um, but what's the what's the identity of specialty? Specialty is actually it's kind of more of a, a catch all for uh, classes that are very specialized in what they do. Um, like as a good example, um, one of the classes in the specialty area is the herbalist. Mm -hmm. Um, and for them, a lot of what they focus on is like poisons and, um, antidotes, um, and stuff like that. So they, they're, they're definitely designed to be able to like do wilderness stuff and survive in the wilderness in different ways. But a lot of their power, like their quote unquote powers, um, come into much more specialized areas. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's kind of like it's kind of a way of basically being like you know if you want to go here understand that you know you're this particular class is very specialized mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind well i'd like you to give me a few examples of of a class in the in this instance so we so i could get a grasp on how on how in depth an individual one is mm -hmm. Um, so, let's see here, um, I will, I'll, I'll go through, uh, the Meliest class. Um, the Meliest class, uh, they, obviously they deal with melee weapons in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Um, their class bonus is, is that they don't have to deal with some of the negatives that come along with melee weapons. Uh, melee weapons have, um you know, positive and negative traits that come along with them. Um, and if you're a Malleus, you get to ignore um, some of the negative traits that other, because, you know, you're, you're more trained to deal with these weapons. Um, so that's the, that's the bonus you get for having the class itself. Mm -hmm. um, your skills that are, that you're trained in when you get that class, you get uh, melee, athletics, and evasion. Um, and then after that, I, if I remember right, there are 15 merits that you can choose from. Um, you get to pick one merit in character creation per class. Um, mm -hmm. But some of those merits could be, you know, def you know, using your melee weapons to deflect things. You know, um, I believe that one of them is basically kind of like a taunt from like MMOs mm -hmm. uh, to help you deal with like long range people. Um and uh, some of it's like specializing in specific types of, of melee weapons. Um, there's a lot. There's like I said, there's like 15 merits that you can choose from. Yeah. Uh, and taking that taking that into account, taking that into account, mm -hmm. uh, you've descri you've described spell you've described the setting of Spellburn as this alternate history where where magic was discovered in the Bronze Age, um, mm -hmm. but from what from if I recall correctly, the the current timeline that you're that you're going with Spellburn is more is more akin to the tech level that was in the First World War. Correct. Um, what made you go with that? What made you go with that with that approach? Um, originally Spellburn was actually set in a fantasy world, um, and then a friend convinced me to set it in the real world. Um, originally they had convinced me to set it during the Civil War, um, and then other people were trying to convince me to set it during World War II, and I was kind of like, both of these are really overplayed, but everybody ignores World War I. Um, I'd... and World War I was a pretty pivotal time period in the world for setting up the whole 20th century. Mm -hmm. And... You are correct in this in that sense, even with video games, because while while there have been there have been a fair amount of World War One video games, um, most of them have been strategy games, mm -hmm. which is going to have a certain ceiling, especially grand strategy games, which are the turbo nerdest of turbo nerd when it comes to that kind of thing. Um, the recent ex the recent exception has been Battlefield 1 mm -hmm. which um 
it's funny it's funny looking back on it where I said where I said at the time that it felt like Battlefield was was returning to form and then we mm. see what came after that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a game a game so bad that EA is trying to pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> um, when you say Battlefield are you talking about uh, the Star Wars Battlefield game or which that, one are you talking about? Um well, Bat- Battlefront is da- ba- the Star Wars game is Battlefront. That's the one you're thinking of. Which oh, okay. Is downstream from Battlefield. Oh, okay. Um, but Battlefield One was t- what had um was t- was was be- was rooting itself in World War One, probably because the oh, last okay. times with three and four they tried to do the whole modern warfare thing and it didn't quite work. Which I think gave Dice the leverage to do a World War One game. Ah, uh, okay. And I think they, I think they did, I think they did a decent job, especially given how Vic. I'd say, um, I'd say, but I say World War One was the dawn of the concept of um, armored warfare. Mm-hmm. You were you're starting you're kind of seeing a you're kind of seeing a transition a transition away from from the from a lot of the styles that were still rooted in in pike and shot and into more mo, more mobilized tactics. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, I th- I think the other reason that you don't see as many World War One games is the is the fact that the sides are not as clear cut as in World War Two. Yeah. With World War Two, you have the Allies and you have the Axis. You can build around that pretty simply. With yeah. World War One, you have everybody because because Europe was such a powder keg due to the network of alliances that happened. Mm-hmm. And that that's why historians have said that even if Archduke Ferdinand wasn't sh- wasn't killed when he was, World War One was going to happen. Yeah, World War One was going to happen regardless. It's just what was gonna set it off, yeah. And well, in that in that in that particular case, it was the it was the issue of the the Ser- the Serbians, and ironically, the fact that Ferdinand was not like his father. He wa- he actually wanted to convert convert Austria Hungary from a, from an empire into into a uh, United States of Austria Hungary. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure whether he whether he would have succeeded if he lived, but it's you have that you have that interesting setup, and I'm guessing one of the other reasons you you sat you sat down with World War One is because of the fact that it that it isn't that the sides aren't as clear cut. You had multiple sides all over the place. Yeah, that is one of the reasons. Um, and one of the ways that I chose to set it up in the Spellborn world is based on the country's viewpoint on magic. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's pretty much kind of like, there, there's there's no guaranteed alliances in any way, shape, or form. But, you know, most of the nations are built, you know, like there's the tech nations that are basically risk averse to magic. And then you got the magic nations that are, you know, risk tolerant to magic. And then you got the adaptive nations in the middle who use some tech and use some magic, but probably not as recent tech as the tech nations. Um, And that's one of the ways that the alliances have tended to fall in this game, Um, you know, that, that led up to you know, a Ferdinand type scenario. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when it comes to when, when I saw when I saw that you had the the concept of magic being intro, being introduced in the Bronze Age, what mm-hmm. kind of came to mind is the waxing and waning of magic as presented in Earth Dawn and Shadowrun because they were originally mm-hmm. in the same continuity. Uh, long story there, mm-hmm. but. You had di- you had magic being referred to as di- in in its resurgence in different worlds, but in your do you have was it a similar thing in your case or was it a case of a type of energy that was discovered in the Bronze Age? It was a type of energy that was discovered in the Bronze Age. It's basically a natural phenomenon mm-hmm. that gravity is. Um, although some people had theorized in the game that 
that there may be some sort of semi-intelligent consciousness behind magic. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's always been that way, basically, from the Bronze Age forward. Once they discovered it, you know, uh, and the thing is that anybody can use it, even if you're not trained to be a mage. Um, a character, you know, who has no training to, to be a mage can potentially cast spells. The problem is, is that they have a higher chance of what's called spell mutation, where basically the spell you'll cast ends up being nothing like the spell you tried to cast. Yeah. And that bring that brings me to a question regarding the regarding the magic system that you have, since it is mm-hmm. that form of of energy. Mm-hmm. Do you treat spells as a as a fire and forget kind of thing, or would people be um, customizing their customizing spells the way you'd customize equipment? Um, so it's a little bit of both. Uh, you it, none of the spells are fire and forget, um, but the it, there's basic rules and advanced rules for spells. Mm-hmm. Um, the basic rules for spells, you know, you you basically will kind of set up um, how your spell fires every time. Um, in exchange for having a better chance of your spell not mutating. Um, now, there's wiggle room in that too if you choose to set it up that way. Um, if you use the advanced rules, which, you know, from playtesting, we, we found we had to separate them out a little bit, um, you, get the, you get the full ability to customize your spell however you want. Mm-hmm. And given. So take taking that into account, let's let me run a little experiment by you. Yeah. If some if somebody want if somebody wanted to if somebody if somebody wanted to to craft a spell together to have the effects of say a fireball, you know, mm-hmm. a good a good old a good old magic style grenade, um, mm-hmm. how would they, how would they go about that in your system? Uh so that would be uh, a heat spell. Mm-hmm. Um and what they would do is they would choose um, the heat spell is, is the first thing that they would choose. Um, then they would enhance the heat spell with um, range, so that, you know they're not they're not exploding the fireball on top of themselves. Um, after that, they would probably if they wanted to make the grenade effect, they would charge the spell with an area effect, mm-hmm. um, and then they'd use whatever else they had left for for charging it with damage. And heat spells automatically come along with some it, with some bonus damage on its own. Mm-hmm. So you could sit there and target an area and basically be like, okay, this this area is you know a hundred feet away from me, and I'm going to engulf a fifteen by fifteen foot area, and I'm going to do a lot of amounts of damage. All right. Now to further twist that, let's let's suppose that instead of instead of it being a f- instead of it being a f- a fireball like grenade, mm-hmm. what if instead they wanted it to be a flashbang, not to do damage, but just bl- but just blind people? That would be a light spell, and you could use the exact same system, um, you know, to basically like put off a flashbang right around a certain area, or even if you really needed to, right around yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, you can make it a touch spell if you don't put any range on it. Yeah. Um. Uh, and. In the, if somebody now if somebody wanted to take take the explosion effect of that, but turn it into, but instead of making it a ranged thing, make it more like a triggered trap. How would they how would they modify this formula? So you 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 can actually put spells into traps if you wanted to do so. Mm-hmm. Um, you can you can enchant objects with spells, um, but there is no. Like when you're casting a spell in Spellburn, you're basically a mage is kind of like they're they're channeling the energy, kind of like electricity that goes through a wire. So, mm-hmm. you know, they're doing their verbal and somatics, you know, and then the spell occurs. So you can't really delay a spell except for to charge an item with that spell. All right, that ma- that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to the limitations. Some some do the Vancian model, which personally I'm not a fan of. Some do a some do a point system, which I'm a little bit mm-hmm. favorable for. And mm-hmm. some have more esoteric approaches, like spe- like spell drain or the or all of the peril stuff that that 
Warhammer does. How do you what what limitation factor do you have when it comes to spell use? So there's two limitation factors. Um, number one, um, these are based on your character's attributes. Mm -hmm. um, you have spells per day, um, which is it doesn't actually mean that you know like if I had spells per day of ten, I can actually keep casting beyond ten. It's just the problem is is that my spell mutation range gets larger and larger as I keep doing it. Um, and so that's one limitation. The other limitation is what's called potency. Uh, potency is how much magic you can channel through yourself at one time. Mm -hmm. um, on one end, if you um, if you channel less than your total power, it actually helps your spell your your spells be more stable. Um, if you channel more than your total power, then you actually get what's the name of the game spell burn. You know, so you can actually choose to overpower your spells at the cost of hit points. Mm -hmm. And but it's it sounds is potency a kind of upper limit to how much to how much you can amp spells safely? Yes, basically it's it's the it's the upper limit where if you ch if you're running any more electricity through a wire, it's going to start to burn out. Mm -hmm. Now, with that in mind, is is spell is spell casting and is spell casting a skill? Is it an attribute or is it both? It's both. Um, there is e each spell type. Um, that cut, like basically like if you were to have elemental spells, that comes, you know, all elemental spells are governed by a specific attribute. Um, but then there's two type, there's two skills that come along with it mm -hmm. um, for different spells and different, you know, for different uses of a spell um, that you know govern how you know you cast a spell, um, and it also matters a bit. Like you can. You know, however you choose to do your verbal and somatics, because in Spellburn, it's not about like, you know, you can sit there and you can chant in Latin, you know, and wave your hands around, you know, however you want. Or, you know, if you really want to play a silly character, you could dance the hokey pokey and, you know, sing the chicken song. Um, you know, that's how if that's how your casting is and you really want to play a super silly character, go for it. <laughs> um I'd be lying but if I said I never, I never, I never had yodeling as a spell component. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I mean I could totally see that happening. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that that's basically how you know it all works together. Mm -hmm. So, with given the, given that what we already you already mentioned heat and light, which I'm guessing I'm guessing are two spell skills in this case um what would be some examples of some of some of the others um well they're not heat and light are um they're actually spells mm -hmm. um that the the elementalists are broken down by like a, a much more kind of pure viewpoint of um the type of spells but um a good example my, my favorite magic class is the necromancers um they, you know, you can actually raise dead. You can actually, you know, do things to harm and, con you know, undead. Um, there's a lot of, you know, in some way, shape, or form, dealing with, you know, death, you know, mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Uh, they're the only one. The necromancers are the only ones in the game who can actually uh, revive dead characters, although they have a very short time period to do so. Um, so I, I, I like those, um, and. You got illusionists, um, you know, and I, I the illusionist was kind of hard to to make because it was kind of like, you know, how do I create a magic class of you know with creating illusions and not be too close to Vampire the Masquerade Ravenous? Mm -hmm. um, so I had to I had to watch on that one. Um, you've got the healers who are kind of kind of like D, D clerics except for the fact that magic in this game doesn't tend to have lasting effects um like you'll actually heal damage from magic faster than you'll heal mundane damage um and you know like healing hit points from healer magic isn't permanent because the moment they turn that spell off you know in instead of keeping it as an ongoing effect all that damage gets reapplied mm -hmm. so you have to you know you actually have to seek out doctors and medicine people etc 
And speaking speaking of that, when it comes to health, are you operating under a wound system with with gradual penalties, a la a la vampire, or do you have are are you doing hit points? A bit of both, actually. Um, there, you have hit points as as your main source of tracking how healthy your character is is the time. Um, but there is also a wound system that uh, can be applied depending on how much damage you take per attack. Mm -hmm. Is it is the damage you take per attack? Is that akin to massive damage? Um, kind of. Um, you, you can have minimal damage. You can have uh, massive damage. Um, it it basically it, the question is, is how you built your character. You know, if your character is physiologically, you know, like doesn't have a whole lot of stamina, you're more likely to take wounds. Mm -hmm. Um. Than you know, if a character was built to be super tough, um, so it's got. There's one of the things that I tried to do very strongly was balance out the combat classes versus the magic classes versus the social classes and the intelligence classes, in that each of them have a way to be a threat, um, but there are things that threaten them too, um, and a lot of the wounds are more threatening. Uh, Four classes that are basically kind of like social and mental classes, mm -hmm. uh, because you're, mess, you're you're less likely to naturally put attributes into the things that would protect you from wounds. Yeah. Now that doesn't necessarily you know guarantee it, but it, it's it's usually how most players we've seen build their characters, build them. Mm -hmm. And with that in with that in mind. When it comes when it comes to when it, com when it comes to actual combat, I'm guessing that even people who put a, who who are more social characters will have will have some means of being able to participate in a firefight. Mm -hmm. um, well, it's it, even if you even if you chose no combat classes at all, you always have the ability um, in character creation to a invest a, you know so in in the skills for you know a firefight if you know if you choose to if not um there's another system beyond hp you know your ability to survive a fight is tracked in two ways you've got your you know your hit points but you've also got your morale um and morale can be affected by a number of different things but it can also be affected by social characters or characters you know trying to do things like intimidate people or get them to surrender um and you know when you when your morale hits zero your you, your character will surrender or will flee the combat mm -hmm. so um that's how the social and mental characters can come into play even if they chose to have you know no combat skills at all mm -hmm. um they can go after enemies morale that cer that certainly makes sense. Um, it's that's one of that's one of the tricky things that happens with um with games that have social characters is that as nice as that is, eventually a firefight's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of games that have social characters, they're often left with not as much to do. Mm -hmm. And within that. That bring that brings me to to some to something else because the way you've described classes, I keep getting this, I keep getting this vibe of um of ta of a talent tr of an individual of each class being its own little talent tree. Is mm -hmm. that accurate or not so much? Um, not so much. Not if you're talking like like a World of Warcraft talent tree. Um, I was actually thinking no, more of a Diablo talent tree. Yeah, no, it's it's not like the Diablo talent trees. It's it's much more open ended. Mm -hmm. um, things don't stack on top of one another. Um, In that so, regard, I get. I guess the better. I guess the better point of comparison would be um, would be the talent system used in in um, the spheres system f for Pathfinder. You know, I've never actually played. Uh, Pathfinder or Sphere system, but I have uh, somebody actually did comment to me about a month ago that the that uh, they thought the the merit system that I had kind of reminded them that way. Yeah, I'm specifically referring to Spheres of Power, Spheres of Might, and Champions of the Spheres, mm -hmm. which yeah, that's trades the casting system for a talent based system. Mm -hmm. Um, 
you can buy you can buy into a talent that you can buy into a sphere at any time just by spending a talent point or you mm -hmm. could further or you could use those talent points to further develop what you can do with a given sphere because mm -hmm. getting a sphere with that with that give is going to give you um a cup one or two abilities right out of the gate if you if you get the destruction sphere you're automatically going to get destructive blast if you mm -hmm. if you buy more destructive sphere talents there's more stuff that you'd be able to do with destructive blast whether it be el whether it be elemental damage or something else that's ki that's kind of where I was going with with the whole tree thing. Kind of, uh, but uh, so it's kind of like that, and like you could almost describe a sphere being like a class, um, but it's instead of there being any sort of order to it, you know, like you don't have to start with your you know destructive blast. You could start with you know acid blast. Mm -hmm. um, kind of kind of deal like if you so chose to or something like that if there was acid blast um well you can't it's a, you, you can take acid blast right out of the gate mm -hmm. oh. but that brings me to something else a uh, okay. one of the one of the most common fantasies that pe that people have in character creation is gishing if you're familiar with that term I'm not um a gish is any character that that can that can be that's moderately all right at both fighting and casting. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on it's based on the Geth Zerai in that showed up in um, first showed up in AD and D and have made sporadic appearances since. Mm -hmm. But it's generally the idea of somebody being able to f being able to fight and being able to cast. And some mm -hmm. games have handled this kind of concept better than others. We 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 do handle that in this game because, like I said, you can multi-class in any direction you want. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing, given that given that it would be it would be very easy for someone to do that, as opposed to the more ubiquitous fantasy games where you have to go through this elaborate multi-classing system, and even then, you're still going to be outclassed by people moderately dedicated into either side of it. Yeah, no, this is since it well, especially since this is a levelless system, mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, if you multi-class, you know, like let's say you were to be a brawler and an elementalist and then something else. Um there there are actually like merits that actually kind of combine the two in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. Um and you can logistically work, you know, both of them out um to you know to do things together so you know there's there's no penalization for being you know a combat class and a magic class at the same time sometimes you may not be able to use both powers at the exact same time um but there's no penalty against it mm -hmm. and given the given the imagery that you that you've had with world war 1 with with um so, with some elements of magic I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure that somebody's pitched the idea of doing a, um, a gun mage at some point to you. Oh yeah, we uh, that's uh, the um, the the adaptive nations. You know, that's one of their big things. Is they t that they tend to take like civil war era tech and then enchant it with magic. Mm -hmm. Um, because the 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 newer the more complicated a piece of technology it is in this game, the harder it is to enchant with magic. So those nations will start with easier things to enchant and use them. So you can you can uh, we we've had gun mages in playtests before. Okay, better question is it have you had a gun mage trying to a bayonet charge? I have not had that one yet. <laughs> I am disappointed. I would I would have I would have expected at least at least one gun mage to stand up and shout, <laughs> "Men fix bayonets." <laughs> no, I've never had a player do that yet. I guess Although I, I could totally see it because because the bayonet would be really easy to enchant. So yeah, so it would be a, it. It just seems it just seems like a like a like a simple thing to to do. Plus the idea the idea of having a having a hundred people char charging with charging with haste. With with bayonets at the with bayonets at the ready just makes me laugh. 
You know, yeah, I've got a couple of play tests that are coming up uh, in in July, and I, I I think I now have an idea of what to do to them. Uh, hopefully none of them. Hopefully none of them are listening. <laughs> uh, especially since one of the recent recently, I ended up re I ended up replaying um, um, Call of Duty World at War, the mm -hmm. arguably the arguably one of the last good CODs, and one of the one of the things in the early chapters that really puts you on the defensive is dealing with the bonsai charge. Because <laughs> you you would think, oh, you've you've got firearms. Having a bunch of people ch having a bunch of people charge at you shouldn't be that much of an issue. That's not true. <laughs> no, nope. especially not when they outnumber you. And no matter how good of a shot you are, you can't fire that fast. Uh, I, I'm, I'm ex-military, so it's kind of like, you know, I, I'm pretty sure that I could handle about four people charging at me at once. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, uh, I'm probably dead. Probably, probably not 20, at minimum. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, and, the, and given that... Now, given that, I know I know you're currently in a play, in a playtesting phase, but were there any um, were there any mechanics that you were re that you felt really strongly about early on, but after playtesting realized, yeah, this isn't going to work? No. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry, mail manager showed up. Um, no, actually, we've taken all the mechanics where some people had problems with them, and we moved them to being optional rules. Um, because there's been some mechanics where it's been like, some people really love the mechanic and then some people really hate the mechanic. Mm -hmm. Um, so we took those, the ones where we got like a 50, 50 divide and just moved them to being optional rules. Mm -hmm. I can, which I can, I'm guessing that's the reason why you have a basic and advanced version that you've been developing. Correct. I, I can I can certainly see that. And speaking of that, when it comes to when it comes to combat and when it comes to firearms, there's all there's there's always this issue of how of how to make sure that that people can unless you're dealing with a game that explicitly is favoring firearms, how to ba how to balance the use of firearms and melee. Um, how do you go how do you go about that? So if somebody wants to do the charging with an officer saber they'll they'd be able to do that um so the game does fi favor firearms um firearms don't necessarily do any more damage but they have the ability to punch armor mm -hmm. um on the other hand the classes like the brawler and the meleeist have merits that help them close distance faster and or help them help protect them more um so they're able to try and get within that close the close quarters area where you know a gun may not be as quite as effective anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it is it's it's balancing back and forth between um, you know finding ways to close and close safely with an enemy versus you know the marksmen who are always trying to keep you at a distance. So there's kind of the the push and pull there that occurs. Mm-hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, I know you're I know you're doing some play tests later this year, but do you have plans on putting a public play test document um in the out in the in the fall or in early 2023? Um I hadn't planned on doing that yet. Uh, we're still trying to work on a couple of bugs before I get to that. Um my mm -hmm. plan was uh probably about the same time as we do the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. um, was to actually re release um, a free play test version of the game, mm -hmm. and I, I will I will certainly be keeping an eye out for that when the t when the time comes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, which because it's so early on, that's why I'm not going to ask for a for a launch time for the Kickstarter because yeah, I don't I don't even know if you know it by, at this juncture. <laughs> yeah, a, a lot of it comes down to getting the art together is going to be the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm guessing my guess is next year. <laughs> mm -hmm. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to 
come on to my show and enjoy the madness at play here. No, thank you. This was this was a fun conversation. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Cheers. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!